Do you ever record a half hour video and then realize that you hate the lighting and the way you're sitting? Or is that just me? <laughs> Hi everyone, I hope you're all having an awesome day. I'm just jumping on here to do a Q&A because I realized that I haven't answered a bunch of questions in a really long time. So here we are. I jumped onto Instagram stories yesterday to see if any of you had any questions, whether music related or non-music related, and we're going to be answering them now. So here we go. Alexandra asked, what's your favorite part of flute? So I'm a woodwind doubler, which means that the clarinet is my specialty instrument. It's the one that I focus most of my time on, and it's the one that I studied throughout my degree at university. However, I also play the flute and the saxophone and a bit of bassoon. I'm not the best at it. Um, and I really love doing woodwind doubling because it's helped me get more teaching work if I need it and perform in different musicals throughout the year when I'm not in a lockdown. But I have really been loving the flute lately and I love the flute so much because I can take a couple of weeks off from the flute and then pick it up again and my embouchure will not be in pain like he's on the clarinet. If I take a couple of weeks off from the clarinet I'll come back to it and I will feel so chopped. My mouth will be in pain and it will take me quite a lot of practice and a lot of work to get it sounding awesome again and not hurting. With the flute I can come back to it and I might not have the best tone Usually I'll be a little bit too tight when I come back to the flute. Uh, everything around here will be way too tight um, and it just won't have those harmonics in my sound. But I can work on it for like half an hour and then I'm pretty happy with my sound again. I do find flute a bit technically challenging. Obviously the fingerings are a little bit different as, and especially when you get up into that upper register, all of the fingerings are really awkward. Um, so. I don't love it in that aspect um, and I do get a little bit terrified every single time I see flute solo written on a piece of music that I'm playing in a musical or piccolo solo. That's terrifying. But I do love playing the flute because it feels so relaxing. You can play it for hours and not be in pain and it's just a beautiful instrument. Rachel asked, any tips on doing clarinet for VCE music? So for those of you who aren't in Melbourne, VCE music is our final two years of high school are called VCE, and then we do a music subject. And at the end of year 12, our final year of high school, we have to do a recital. My biggest piece of advice for doing VCE music is to listen to recordings. When I was in VCE, I was always told by my teacher, I'm sorry, Paul, um, to listen to recordings of my pieces. And did I? Not really. I listened to about one recording of each of my pieces. And that's totally fine to kind of get an idea of how the piece sounds or what it will sound like with the accompaniment and everything. But the problem was I got to my first rehearsal with my accompanist at the end of the year and I was playing um, In Rhythm by Templeton from the Pocket Size Sonata. And the one recording that I chose to listen to on repeat did the final section half time. So I got to my rehearsal and I went But really, the real tempo is ba -da -ba -da -da. So I was screwed and I was like, what is going on? I'm so lost. Turns out I just didn't listen to enough recordings. So listen to as many recordings as you possibly can. And if anyone near you is doing any performances of your pieces, whether that's at a university or at another school, go and listen to those performances. Um, that'll really help you out with understanding your piece a lot more. My other tip is just to realize that you do need to get your pieces with the metronome very consistently and have that rhythm so consistent and it has to sound kind of boring at first but everything has to be 100% accurate and then after that you're free to make your artistic and stylistic choices to make that piece sound your own. So I got a lesson with David Griffiths at the end of VCE who ended up becoming my university clarinet teacher and he roasted me on a few of my pieces saying this is boring and like do this with your phrasing and you're not slowing down enough here or you're slowing down too much. And I was so confused. I was like, but Paul said to do this, but Dave said to do this. Who do I listen to? I'm so confused. Am I learning this piece wrong? Ah! But you just have to realize that you do have to get it really consistently with the metronome and then you get to choose 
how you phrase it. Now, usually it's a really good idea to listen to your teacher, but also listening to all of these different recordings, you can decide out of your 10 favorite recordings of the one piece, which sections you like from each recording. You might go, wow, I really liked how they phrased this section here. And I loved how they did their staccatos here. It was really crispy or it had a bit of a bounce to it. Um, or it had a really exciting energy. So you can make it your own towards the end of the year when it's getting closer to your recital, but really focus on getting it really accurate with the metronome first. Julie asked, what is your favorite thing about making music? I was thinking about this a lot last night. I was listening to Imogen Heap with my headphones on. And if you haven't listened to Imogen Heap, she has these really cool like dissonant and clashy chords, but they are so stunning and they get me feeling so emotional because you right, Laura, at the age of 13, who was like really emotional over boys and school, um, would listen to Imogen Heap on the school bus. I felt like so alone and no one understood my music taste. I was listening to this weird music at the age of 13, but it was so complex and you could feel all of these emotions. Like in a piece of music, you can feel when someone is having their heart broken and you can feel when they're distraught if they've lost someone or you can feel when someone is feeling so happy because they've just gotten their dream job like music can convey all of these different emotions but it's especially apparent when it creates all of these chords so if you're playing in an ensemble of people you you are part of this beautiful sound that creates these magical chords that creates these emotions and when you're playing by yourself in the practice room, you probably can't even hear that. And you're just hearing your one part. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is so boring. I can't get this articulation right. I can't get it fast enough. But then you listen to it with the whole ensemble, whether that's a chamber group or an orchestra or a concert band, and you hear it and you're like, ah, oh, that's why. Like, this is how my part fits in with everyone else. And it creates this magic. So... That's my favorite part about making music, being a part of something greater than just what you're playing. Azuriel asked, what brand and read size do you use? I have been using for the last three years, the Diodario Reserve Evolutions in size 3.5 plus. I've been using these for so long. I love them so much. Basically, since the moment that they came out, these have been the reads that I've been using. Before these, I was using the Purple Box because I won a competition where I won literally 12 boxes of the Purple Box of these. So I was using them for quite a while, but I find that these ones they just last a little bit longer than the purple box um they just work a lot better for me before that i was using van doren v12s which i still love but i find that these are just a little bit more consistent in a box um if i'm doing a gig and i happen to have a read disaster and i need to play on one straight out of the box i know that whatever one i'll pick out of the box will most likely work one or two reads and i will find one that i can play a gig on if need be i don't recommend doing that but if you have to they're good Dan B. Dextrous asked, are tuning rings worth it? Playing on a B12 with R13 barrel and it plays sharp. I'm probably not the best person to ask with tuning rings. I had some for a little while, um, but I never used them. Every time I was sharp, I couldn't be bothered putting in a tuning ring. I would just pull out the barrel. If you're sharp, just pull out or get a longer barrel. But I could never be bothered using tuning rings. I don't really understand them not the best person to ask, I just pull out. So in my opinion, they're not worth it, but probably get a better opinion. <laughs> Madison asked, tips for burnout while in uni. Uni can be really hard. You're doing a degree for three or four years where you have to play like three hours a day to learn a piece of music or several pieces of music within 12 weeks, or in the case in Australia, it's probably the same everywhere else, a whole semester where you're literally just doing tech work and you're learning all of these scales and excerpts and studies and it can be really bloody boring and not exciting at all and it's really easy to get burnt out so i have a few tips for that my first tip is that when you have a uni break take it don't keep on playing every single day for three hours throughout the uni break take some time off and don't feel guilty for it if you need to take a couple of weeks off do it that's what the uni breaks are for. They're your time to go and explore, do other things, go for walks, go on a hike, read some books, go on an adventure, go eat a new food. I don't know. That's your time to go and explore and take some time off from your instrument. If you keep on playing every single day, you will get burnt out. My second tip is to try and get creative with the pieces that you're learning. So for example, when I was learning Paganini Caprice number 24, 
I would memorize a whole section and then I would march around my practice room playing that over and over and over again because then that was a way of me memorizing the piece and making sure that I knew it really, really well and marching it around made me go, okay, well, if I can march while playing this, then I definitely know this very well. Whenever I'm learning a lyrical piece, I like to memorize it then turn off the lights, close the curtains, play in a pitch black room. Um, and then I can like, you know, dance when I'm playing the music and it helps me get out all of those emotions in the piece as well. So get really creative with the things that you do have to practice. And my last tip is to play things that you like as well. So whenever I'm not feeling very motivated, I might get out a piece of music from a concert band or orchestra and play through that. And I'll have the recording going through earphones so that it sounds like I'm playing with the full ensemble and it gives you that sense that you're playing, you know, with a greater purpose other than just playing your part. How tall are you? I am 163 centimeters tall or five foot four. Shane asked, your, what is your favorite hobby other than music? I love doing quite a few different things. Obviously, other than music, I do audio and video editing, but I love going for walks on the beach. I love drinking coffee. I love reading, but I think most of all, my favorite hobby would be pole dancing, which I started earlier this year. I'll insert a little clip of me pole dancing here. Kara asked, where do you find your motivation? To be honest, my motivation isn't always there. I don't know if this is because I'm a Capricorn, but I always have to be doing something, whether it's audio editing or video editing or creating a new project or writing out some sheet music or recording something or practicing. I always have to be doing something because if I'm not, my brain will go, Laura, what are you doing? You're not doing anything. You're being lazy, go do something. So I'm always doing something, but it's not necessarily the thing that I should always be doing. Um, so in terms of practice, the biggest tip that I have for motivation is to literally just get started. You're not always gonna have motivation to practice. Sometimes you literally just have to force yourself to set up your instrument, set up your music stand and your sheet music and play for te like 10 minutes. If you can do 10 minutes of practice, it'll be really easy for you to keep on going and that 10 minutes will very quickly become half an hour. That half an hour will become an hour. Don't feel like there's any pressure to go longer than 10 minutes. You can literally just do 10 minutes and if you hate it, pack up your instrument, go do something else. But you'll probably find that you wanna keep on going and give yourself something really easy to start with. So if you start with a piece of music that you know that you can sight read or you can learn you know, within five minutes, then when you finished playing that piece, you'll go, wow, look at me go. I just played through a whole piece. I am amazing. And then you want to do another piece and it might be a little bit harder. And then you'll find something technically challenging in there that you need to work on. It might just be one bar or a whole line. You'll focus on that one line playing with the metronome over and over, making sure it's really accurate. And then you'll be like, wow, look at me go. I learned another piece. And then that cycle will continue. So start really basic just for 10 minutes and force yourself to practice every single day for one week, even if it's just 10 minutes a day, that's only like an hour in one week and see how you go and your motivation will come from there. But don't forget that you're not gonna be motivated every single day. Some days it's literally about just forcing yourself to do it and making it into a habit rather than something that you love doing every day. Cause you won't love it every day and it's great if you do, but some days are going to be a struggle and that's when it's important to just say, okay, just 10 minutes, that's all I've got to do. Rami asked, please name books of clarinet for practicing and developing. Thank you. So I have a lot of books that I love for the clarinet, but I'll show you a few of my favorites. I've got my big pile. So if you want to become an absolute technique gun on the clarinet, I highly recommend the Behrman Method. This is Opus 63 of the third division, which is just full of scales. You can see that I've flagged my book, so I've separated it into each of the different sections in the book. The flags that I have are scales, broken chords, diminished sevenths, interrupted scales, hard broken chords, returning scales, major seventh chords, diverse chords, scales in thirds, and sixths. So pretty much any single scale that you want to learn will be in the Behrman method. Highly recommend it if you want to get your technique back. It is very hard though, and sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming. If you want to start with something a little bit easier that is not as scary, I highly recommend the Vade Mecum, which you can get on IMSLP. And you can just choose to do a couple of lines of that a day, or you can go through the whole entire book. But that starts off a little bit easier than the Behrman method. 
very similar to the Vade Mecham, uh, um, these books by Rainer Vela, who was Sabine Meyer's husband. So he wrote three books um, that are called The Clarinet Fundamentals. The first book is Sound and Articulation, which is great just for getting your tone back and if you want to focus on your articulation and make sure that your tongue is doing exactly what you want it to be doing. The second book is a systematic fingering course, which is basically the same as Vade Mecham, except instead of working in 16 notes or semiquavers you're working in triplets and quintuplets so the rhythm is a little bit more difficult and you're forced to actually focus and the note that you're starting on changes for each beat um, but I highly recommend that book as well and the third book from clarinet fundamentals is intonation you kind of do need to have a little clarinet buddy to work on this intonation book because it's working on excerpts and listening to what the other clarinet player is playing and trying to get that intonation correct and matching and changing and adjusting um, but those are some really great books I have a few study books that I highly recommend. So this is the Rose 40 studies for clarinet, but I also love the Rose 32. I actually prefer the Rose 32 to the Rose 40, but I don't have that one printed. These are great studies that are awesome for like an intermediate to late high school um, and early university. They are a lot more lyrical and beautiful than some of the other study books that I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, so they can be a little bit more interesting to play because they actually sound like a real piece of music when you finish learning it. The study book that I had to focus on throughout university was the All 48 Etudes, 48 Studies. Um, these are hard. They're really bloody hard and they're really modern and they have a lot of accidentals in there. They're not always the most fun thing. Some of them are quite painful. Um, I have definitely not learnt the whole entire book. They're really bloody hard. Some of them would take me probably a few weeks to learn if I wanted to. Others would only take me a couple of days. Um, so there's the all. This is the first book. I also have the second book as well, which is the second half of the 48 studies. Really hard, but awesome if you want to work on some difficult fingerings and intervals. The final study book that I really love are the Cavallini 30 Caprices. I love this a lot more than I love the All. These are a little bit more melodic and less modern. They actually do sound really nice. My favorite one out of the book is Cavallini number 20, which kind of reminds me of like an electric guitar or something, like a riff that's over and over and over again, kind of like ACDC, like thunder or something. I don't know, I really love Cavallini 20. And the last book that I love, which I use quite a lot on my students as well, is Tone Technique and Staccato by Galpa. This has an awesome section in it called Transitioning into the Upper Register, which works on um, intervals of twelfths and going over the break. So if you're teaching a student how to go over the break and you're introducing them to the upper register, then this is awesome. They also have quite a lot of close A exercises in here. So this is great for students of all levels. Ambidextrous asked, due to COVID, it's been a long while since I've been able to play the trumpet properly. And so I've been noodling around making arrangements instead, but I still feel a sense of loss and guilt over not practicing and performing like I used to. Any tips on overcoming this? Girl, I get you. <laughs> I totally feel you. And I think the biggest piece of advice I can give to you is that we're all in the same storm with this. We're all kind of dealing with COVID and, you know, have lost all of our gigs and our rehearsals and the ability to have in-person lessons if we want to. So everyone is struggling and it's totally normal to not feel the same sense of motivation that you did prior to COVID. I don't think many people at all are feeling the same sense of motivation. Great to you if you are, but I don't think many people really are feeling awesome about their practice at the moment. And it's totally normal to have a break. Like we are in such a stressful time. Be kind to yourself and give yourself that break if you need to. So I totally feel you. I've been in the same boat and I've had quite a lot of time off from the clarinet just due to things that were happening in my personal life and how I was feeling about the clarinet and being a clarinet player and being part of the clarinet community. And I was really beating myself up going, Laura, you are literally Laura Clarinetist on Instagram. Like, and you're not even practicing the clarinet. Like, who are you and what are you doing? But I was sorting out 
you know, my career and what I want to be doing in life and the different things that I enjoy and just getting through the pandemic, you know. Um, so it's totally okay to have some time off and you need to realize that our journey as musicians is not always going to be linear. You know, sometimes our journey will be improving like in a steady line and then other times we'll have a break for a little while. That's okay. Your learning isn't going to go like that. You're going to have times where you're going awesome and then you're not so great and then back up again. But eventually you will keep on improving, you know. Luckily for us, our journey as musicians never ends. We're always learning new things. Even when we're old one day, we're going to be learning new things. Um, so be really kind to yourself with it. But I also need you to realize that your worth as a person and as a musician is not based on how much you practice. You are so much more than your instrument. You are not just a trumpet player and I'm not just a clarinet player. I am Laura and I'm an introvert who loves reading Harry Potter and going for walks on the beach and doing pole dancing and cuddling my dog. I'm not just the girl that plays the clarinet. That is not all who I am. And you are not just a trumpet player either. You are so much more than that. And your worth is not dictated on how much practice you do either. The only thing that your amount of practice dictates is whether or not you win an audition. At the moment for me, there are no auditions that I want to be going for anyway. I don't really want to have a full-time performing job at the moment. I'm quite happy doing what I'm doing, running my own business. Um, but if I did want to win an audition, then guess what? I will get back into practicing three or four hours a day. But right now, that's not the stage that I'm in. You don't have to be practicing like three hours a day every single day for the rest of your life. When you finish uni, life is very different. You have to work to earn a living so that you can pay rent and you can put food on the table. So that's just a very small amount of time in your life when you do need to be practicing a lot. Same within school. You might be preparing for exams because um, you want to do well. But as I said, your journey isn't always going to be linear and your worth is not based on how much you are practicing. You are important, you are special, you are loved and you are worthy no matter how much you are practicing your instrument. Jace asked, do you have any tips for taking videos for AMEB exams? So for those of you who aren't Australian, AMEB exams are instrument exams that we get to do throughout the year. Um, they have different grades. It's kind of similar to Trinity, I suppose. But instrumental exams for in Australia. So I actually have a student who will be recording their video AMB exam in the next week. My biggest piece of advice is that you have an advantage from this being a video exam. When you're going in for an in-person exam, you have one chance. You only have one time where you get to show them how well you can play these pieces or these scales. When you're doing a video exam, you can record your exam like 20 times if you want to. You don't have to record one time and then go, well, that's it, I'm done. Unless you're paying for an accompanist, but we're in a lockdown. So um, so if you're using the backing tracks that they provide for you, then you can do as many takes as you like. But the only way that you can make that happen is to give yourself a lot of time beforehand. So don't say, okay, video is due today. I must get the perfect take today start recording two weeks before that due date. And so then you could maybe do two takes each day and then in two weeks time, you'll have 28 different videos and you can choose whichever is the best take. If you make a mistake, don't send it in, record it again. That's my biggest piece of advice. Seb asked, how are you doing? Thank you so much for asking. I'm actually doing really well at the moment. My mental health goes up and down sometimes, especially during lockdown. Having every single day being exactly the same is really challenging. And even though I'm not extroverted and I don't love, you know, seeing people all the time, I do love going to cafes and having different environments to work in. I miss going to pole dancing classes. Um, so lockdown is a really big challenge. Um, and I'm not always feeling awesome, but I feel like especially in the last couple of weeks, I've been feeling really great. I've been vlogging a lot, which has been distracting me. I've been getting back into practice and I'm feeling a sense of motivation and I'm kind of understanding who I am a little bit more and what I love rather than just diving myself into doing nine hours of work a day. I've been uh, able to explore different hobbies and all my different passions that I really love doing. So I'm doing well. Thank you so much for asking.
Music nerd for life asked, you play saxophone, right? What's a good read for playing, say, symphonic music? So I'm definitely not a saxophone specialist. In fact, saxophone is one of my least favorite doubles to be playing. Um, so I might not be the best person to ask, but the saxophone reads that I do use are, I use the Hempke alto saxophone Diodario reads in size 2.5. I use this for classical, jazz, musicals, everything just as like an all-round read i've been using these for like five years now these are just the reads that i love the most on saxophone they're really reliable they work for me i don't play saxophone very often so a box of five will usually last me about a year because i don't play it very often especially at the moment um but that's what i use on saxophone olivia asked how do you record your songs do you take off the video and sound separated from each other so i edit my audio in logic pro so i import the video or the whatever the audio is into logic pro if i'm creating my own multi-tracks i'll record directly into logic pro and then from there i can edit so add in some automation some reverb if i need some exciter whatever um different effects that i want to add in and then from there i'll film the video separately just using my iphone and then i'll edit that to create a multi-track in Final Cut Pro. Ivan asked, just how did you start teaching? How were your first times teaching and any suggestions? I remember my first ever Woodwind students. I really hope they're doing well. They're all in high school now. I got my first teaching job from my old clarinet teacher um, and he recommended me for this job that was half an hour away from my house and there were only about four students. The school wasn't very well organized and I was running basically the whole woodwind music department section and invoicing all the parents and dealing with lesson times and scheduling and everything. And I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and I'm definitely a much better teacher now than I was however many years ago. But my biggest piece of advice is to realize that you don't know everything and there, there are gonna be things that you do not know and you will feel stuck and like, and like you don't deserve to have that job. There will be things that you just don't have an answer to. If someone breaks an instrument and you don't understand what's not ceiling on a flute or on a saxophone, ask for help. I was always messaging my teachers going, um, help me, my student saxophone's broken. I can't figure out what's going wrong. Or why, what's going on with their embouchure? There's something funky happening here. Or how do you teach them how to do this? I literally don't understand how to teach tonguing, you know? So ask for help because you're not gonna know everything. And the only way to learn how to teach something and then use it for your future students is to ask for help. So that's my biggest piece of advice. Also understand that you you do know more than your students. Um, and so they're not going to know that, you know, sometimes you don't know the answer to everything, but they also appreciate honesty. If you say, hey, I don't know the answer to this. Let me get back to you on this one next lesson, or I'll let you know throughout the week. Or how about you, you go and do some research on that one and then you let me know next week. They will appreciate that honesty. Um, the other thing that you have to realize is that you do have to start building up a teaching library of sheet music that will, you will use for your students. So you might just start with some beginner students. So you might have just a couple of method books that you use for them and then you can photocopy them if you need. And then once they finish that method book, you might have to invest in a couple of Disney books or in my case, some A and B exam books. Um, and you'll build up your sheet music library. But also if you have anyone that you can ask to borrow some sheet music from them, then ask for that as well because you know especially when I started teaching I was broke and I couldn't afford to get heaps of sheet music books so you'll build up that over time you don't have to start with a huge sheet music library um so just in short ask for help when you need it because you won't know everything and you will feel kind of uncomfortable but you'll get through it and things will improve and become easier Mia asked, do you prefer playing classical music on the clarinet or pop music? I love playing both, but it depends on the situation. So when I'm practicing, I love practicing classical music because it provides that technical challenge and something for me to improve on and get better at. So I love playing classical music. But then when I'm creating multi-tracks, I love creating covers of movie soundtracks and pop music and you know the music that I'm listening to because I find that so much fun there's sometimes some more interesting chords in there that I really love or this piece just like gets me all emotional where like Mozart or Brahms might not get me feeling the same kind of way so I love both but it depends on the situation 
Clarinet Wellington saxophone asked, what brand is your clarinet? My clarinet is a Bakun Q series. This is actually the new Q series, the Q2, which has a Lumiere bore. Um, this got delivered to me about two weeks ago to try out. And since this got delivered, I have not played on my other Q series clarinet because I love this one so much. The new bore um, has made such a big difference to this clarinet. I compared it to my partner's Tosca and oh my God, I prefer this clarinet. It feels like it's just like the clarinet that's made for me. It works. It does what I want it to do. It has a beautiful, warm sound. It just, oh, it's a beautiful clarinet. Raven says, I haven't played flute in months now, maybe over a year. How do you get back to playing? I kind of talked a little bit about this before, but just start really small with absolutely no pressure on yourself. 10 minutes a day with something really, really fun and just force yourself to do 10 minutes a day for one week straight and that motivation will come back. And don't put in any pressure on yourself to play anything perfectly or to play any really hard repertoire. Just something that's really easy for you to play and it doesn't have to be perfect. And then from there, everything will start feeling easier. After a couple of days, your embouchure will start feeling a bit better. Your technique will start improving and you'll get motivation because you'll see improvement there and you'll want to learn a harder piece. So just get started, even if it's just 10 minutes. And I promise you, it will become easier and easier to pick up your instrument every day. Bamba Strucky asked, do you play in a band or an orchestra too? I do. When we're not in lockdown, I play pretty frequently with the Peninsula Chamber musicians. We actually had a rehearsal just before lockdown, which was quite unfortunate because we never got to perform the pieces. Um, they're like a chamber orchestra that I really love playing with. And then throughout the year, I usually play in quite a few musicals throughout Melbourne. Unfortunately, this year and last year, not a lot of shows happened. At the start of the year, I played in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And hopefully at the end of the year, I'll be doing Matilda. But a lot of musicals this year were cancelled due to lockdowns. Um, so I do love doing my woodwind doubling in different musicals. Tuba Train Marty asked, did you ever play alto clarinet? No, I haven't actually. Um, alto clarinets aren't very common, especially in Australia, because um, we're not super huge on concert bands and marching bands and things like over in the US. When I was in high school, I was forced to play the bass clarinet for a term, which I got rid of as soon as I could have because I didn't enjoy it back then. Now I absolutely love playing bass clarinet. Um, but no, I don't have an alto clarinet and I've never had the opportunity to borrow one or to need to borrow one at all. I do have a contra alto clarinet sitting out in my hallway that I've been borrowing for a musical that I was supposed to be doing. Um, but I've never played alto clarinet before. Real Andre 25 asked, are you a fan of jazz literature? I am a classically trained clarinet player, so I do prefer playing classical music because that's what I'm good at. I feel like my appreciation of jazz has improved over the last two years, um, simply because I've had to teach some more advanced saxophone and I've had to kind of immerse myself into listening to jazz music and teaching different jazz repertoire. It's definitely not my specialty and I don't listen to jazz in my spare time. I personally just love listening to pop music, minimalist music, movie soundtracks, concert band repertoire, um, and a little bit of classical music, but I don't find myself listening to any jazz, but I do appreciate it. What software do you use for your transcription? So I posted on my story yesterday that I was transcribing Fireflies by Owl City. I use Sibelius for my transcribing. I really love it. Sometimes it's a bit of a pain in the butt with signing in, um, but I've been using Sibelius by Avid for a lot of years now. I just find it really easy to use. I understand it. The layout makes sense. So I use Sibelius for my transcribing. Amog asked, what are the pros and cons of running your own business? So I run my own business, which is called the Virtual Concert Band, which is this little logo here that's hiding behind my metronome. Um, so I audio and video edit together hundreds of musicians every single month to create this big concert band performance. <laughs> And it's not always really easy. Sometimes I have to deal with some emails that are really scary that I don't want to have to deal with and I have to spend hours on end just doing emails when really I'm a musician, I love performing. Um, and you know, video and audio editing isn't always the most fun thing. Usually I love editing myself and hearing that beautiful outcome of all of those chords. 
and it's not always enjoyable and sometimes I have to force myself to do that work it's not always fun and sometimes there's a lot of pressure on myself because I'm the only one running it and I have to do all of the marketing myself and I don't kind of want to push things on people um, and so I hate doing marketing and so there's lots of things that put me out of my comfort zone that I don't really like doing but at the same time it's amazing that I get to choose when I work and I get to do my own work hours I get to work where I want when I want um, and it's something that I do love doing even though I might not always love audio and video editing it's amazing when I, brought, I get to put together all of these musicians and I hear it come together and I go wow I created that that's pretty magical it's pretty cool and I've created this amazing community of musicians that live all over the world and most of them have never even met each other and we have this awesome community over on Facebook where they're chatting to each other and we're talking about like different instruments and gear and nerding out and how to record and it's so amazing that people are making friends with each other because of this community that I created but it has its ups and it has its downs, um, but I don't think I'd change it for the world. So that is it for all of the questions. Thank you so much for asking them if you did over on Instagram. If you do have any other questions that I haven't answered, feel free to just chuck them down below and I'll answer them in the comment section. But thank you so much for watching and I'll talk to you all soon. Bye.